Well, as we start out this morning, I want us to hear again the words of the Beatitudes. I'm going to invite you to, to join me in reading these. The words will be on the screen. Let's recite these words together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we listen again to the voice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who opens his mouth to offer us blessing, but a blessing that often confuses us and at times scares us. And Father, I pray that as we hear again these words, we might see the blessing that they are and have the courage to live into the kind of life that is truly life. Because it is an image of the life that is in your Son, in, whom, in whose name we pray. Amen. I, I don't know if you guys experience this ever, but sometimes when I am just sitting there minding my own business, not thinking about anything, my brain decides to bring out the highlight reel of the dumbest things I've ever said. Does that ever happen to you guys? It's just like the not top 10 of my interpersonal interactions through my whole life. The story I'm about to tell is one of those that sometimes makes that highlight reel. It happened in Randy Harris's Bible class at ACU. Uh, and the fact that Randy Harris is involved in this story is part of what makes it so cringy for me. And, and I, I know things got a little weird the last time Randy was here. Uh, most of you had never considered calling PETA after a sermon before. But you've got to know that no one has taught me more about the things of God than Randy Harris. Uh, being in a Bible class with him is kind of like learning karate from Mr. Miyagi or having a conversation with Yoda. Uh, and, and so in this Bible class, as we're sitting there learning from Yoda, the, the thing we're talking about for that day are the differences between the various Gospels. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each of them tell the same Gospel story, but they all do it in their own unique way. And some of those differences are obvious, right? The fact that Luke and Matthew give us stories from Jesus' childhood while Mark and John don't. There's, there's some stuff that's big like that. But the stuff that's really interesting is when they tell the same story with just slight differences. What are they trying to teach us? What are they trying to say to us with those slight differences? And one of those slight differences is what we were talking about that day in Randy's Bible class. In all the Gospels, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. In Mark, Luke, and John, there's just one donkey. But in Matthew, it turns out there's two. There's a mother donkey and her colt. And Jesus says, bring both of those to me. And he rides both of those into Jerusalem. And Randy was reading this to us and he asked us the question, why is Matthew different? So Yoda has just asked us a question and so we're all trying to think of the most insightful thing that we could possibly come up with. And then it hit me. And I raised my hand because everyone else needed to hear this thought in my head. And I said, well, you know, Matthew's a tax collector, right? 
Which means, and try to keep up with me here, he's probably pretty good at counting things. So maybe he's just got the right number because he counted better. So the, my theory was basically the other disciples couldn't count over the number one. <laughs> Which makes so much sense of other stuff, right? That's why Luke tells us the story of Jesus calling the one disciples, right? Well, it just makes no sense whatsoever, but I said it, and I still think about it. And now you can think about it too. You can share in my pain. But as it turns out, in this beatitude that we're looking at today in Matthew, Matthew's a little different than another gospel here, too. Because in Matthew, we get, blessed are the poor in spirit. But Luke tells us, blessed are the poor, full stop, period. And so that raises the question, the same question that Randy asked us in his class. Why is Matthew different? And some people have said, well, Matthew was a tax collector. And you think about it, he's probably on the wealthier end of the spectrum. And so maybe he hears Jesus teaching about the poor and he's gotten to Matthew 5 and he's writing this out. Blessed are the poor. And then he pulls up his phone and checks his bank account and he says, in spirit. As if Matthew was trying to soften the blow of what Jesus was saying here. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think Matthew was trying to make Jesus sound softer on how we interact with our possessions and our money. And I don't think he was just trying to talk about spiritual things instead of material things as if those two things don't have anything to do with one another. And instead, I think what's going on is he wants to connect the dots for us. He wants us to see and make obvious that Jesus taught us that how we relate to things, our possessions, affect our souls. He didn't want us to miss Jesus's point, Matthew is telling us that Jesus was very clear. If we want to live in a way that opens us up to the kingdom of God, we have to pay attention to how we relate to our possessions. And I think if we want to take that seriously, what we need to do is listen to those who have taken it seriously before us. This is one of the interesting things about Christianity is that we have consistently had Christians throughout church history that chose to become poor. Right? They, they didn't lose their job. They didn't go bankrupt. They didn't lose it all in gambling or a Ponzi scheme. They chose. They willingly chose to give up everything they had so that they could be poor as they were following Jesus they heard the Holy Spirit inviting them to take that step in their spiritual journey. And, and some of the first Christians to do that are who we call the desert fathers and mothers. These are Christians living around 4th, 5th, 6th century. And if you know world history, you know what's happening is that the Roman Empire is all of a sudden Christian, those stories that we get about persecution in Acts that we know from the early church, those, those have started to go away because now the empire itself, the nation itself is, is Christian. And these desert fathers and mothers were reading through the Gospels and they said, we've got to find a way to em embrace the cross. Things have gotten a little bit too easy for us. And so what they did was they went out into the desert to see what God might teach them there. Giving up everything and living where there's absolutely nothing. Poor in spirit. But this story comes from those desert fathers. 
There's a whole collection of their sayings. The story is one of them. Uh, There were once these two elders who lived in this community, and one day, one of them said to the other one, you realize we've never had a fight. We've never had a quarrel. Let's see if we can do it. Let's start a fight. And the other one said, okay, I'm game. How do we do that? I don't know how to start a fight. I've never been in one. I don't, I don't know how to pick a fight with you. And the other said, okay, well, I got an idea. I'm going to pick up this brick and I'm going to lay it between us. And I'll say, this brick is mine. And you say, no, this brick is mine. And then we'll have a fight. And so that's what they did. He put the brick in between them. He said, this brick is mine. The other said, no, this brick is mine. And he said, no, it is mine. And the other side, the other guy said, okay, it's yours. (laughs) And the story ends, they didn't have a fight. They couldn't figure out how to quarrel. And the deep truth of that story is this. That so much human conflict begins with those words, it's mine. Anyone who has ever taught preschoolers knows that this is true, right? As you walk into a preschool class and it sounds like that scene from Finding Nemo with all the seagulls, mine, mine. I'm embarrassed how many times I practiced that before I got up here, by the way. Most of my preparation for the sermon was that. But even our earliest conflicts between one another, the earliest ages, start from that one word. It's, it's mine. How do you start a fight? It all starts with someone saying, it's mine. And when that's the lens we view our stuff through, the stuff we want and desire through, the stuff we need through, we can't help but see one another as competitors. Because I have to beat you because you want the same thing. And if I want that to be mine, I've got to beat you to it. And we can't help but see one another as threats when we're using the word mine because you might come and take what is mine. And all of a sudden there are all these barriers between us. That's why another guy who chose to become poor, Francis of Assisi, famously said this, if you own possessions, you need weapons to protect them. And so we do not own anything, and we are at peace with everyone. Now, that sounds idealistic and simplistic probably, but what he's saying is touching on something that is profoundly true. Francis recognized that when we no longer use the word mine, our relationship with one another changes. And what Jesus is pointing out to us through the words of Matthew is that when we loosen our grip on the word mine, what opens up between us is the kingdom of God. Just think about what happens in the early church in Acts chapter 4. Read with me, starting in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. The word mind was not part of their vocabulary. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. They are poor in spirit. When Matthew is writing his Beatitudes, he has to have in mind this scene. Communities like this. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. Because for these early Christians, to be poor in spirit means that they had let go of the word Mine, and it meant that regardless of what possessions they may or may not have, as far as their spirits were concerned, they already owned nothing. And because of that, their souls were free to give whatever their neighbor needed. 
because they never claimed it in the first place. And so rather than being held captive by the fear of losing what they felt like was theirs, they behaved as if it wasn't theirs in the first place, and they laid no claim to their own possessions. They stopped using the word mine. And Acts tells us the kingdom was theirs. The kingdom was among them. And that's good news for us. Because that means that can happen between and in and through us as well. That every time our spirits become a little possessive of what we think is ours, a little less possessive, what we do is we take another step into the kingdom of God. And when we become more possessive, we start backing up. And we often take those backward steps, don't we? Because, because this is hard. And we should admit that it's hard. This is not easy because it's easy for anxiety to overtake us. Right? And we all saw what anxiety does to people as it relates to stuff. I am still stockpiling toilet paper. Is anybody else? Uh, there was a moment there that we were needing a little uh, bread and fishes type of miracle in our house with the, with the toilet paper. And I said, never again. My grandkids are going to be asking me, Grandpa, why do you have so much toilet paper? And I'm going to tell them, the year was 2020. <laughs> that's, that's what happens when we're afraid. When we're afraid we may not have enough. We may not have what we need. The, the first instinct is to grab and take and hold on to because I can't trust everyone else to let go of what's theirs and let me have some, even if I don't have enough. Right? That's what that did to my spirit, walking down that toilet paper aisle looking for some. Everyone else is grabbing and taking what's theirs. I'm going to have to do the same. Anxiety can so quickly take over us and cause us to turn inward on ourselves. And what we do in those moments, as we follow Jesus, as we take his words seriously, that the poor in spirit are blessed, is we remember why Jesus calls us to be poor in spirit. Do you know why Jesus calls us to be poor in spirit? It's because God himself is poor in spirit. Because at the center of reality sits the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. Who in Philippians 2 we are told Though he had everything at his fingertips, all of heaven was his. All the glory of God belonged to him. What he did was not try to hold on to it, grasp it, use it to his own advantage. What he did is he became a servant for our sake. He didn't cling to what is his. He said, this is yours too. Which is why I love what Alan brought to us this morning in communion. Because even in this moment where it cost Jesus everything, at least that's what it looked like from an earthly perspective, he's still willing to give. That anxiety never came over him and dictated how he behaved. He was always going to be empty, open-handed with us because that is who God is. There is no mine within God. God is not afraid or threatened by us. God has no need to protect himself from us. And that means that there is no good thing that he wants to withhold from us. God is not possessive or tight-fisted or stingy. Our God gives 
as easily as we breathe. In fact, each breath of ours is a gift from Him because He is poor in spirit. He behaves as if nothing belongs solely to Him, constantly giving it out so that we can join Him in the beauty of that selfless, life-giving love. And if that is how God is, then we have nothing to be scared of in being the same way with one another. If that's how God is, we have nothing to be scared of being that same way with one another. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We've forgotten the word mine just like God has. I, I want to give Jesus the last word today. Would you hear this reading from Matthew 7, also part of the Sermon on the Mount? And hear the character of God described and the call that that brings into our life. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So, and this is the call, because God is like that, so in everything. Do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's pray together. Father, would you bless us with poverty of spirit? A gift we would not think to ask for ourselves. Because we live in a world that constantly reminds us that we might not get what we need. A world that feels threatening and scary at times. We carry trauma from stories of people who've hurt us and take advantage of us. And so it's hard to trust this. It's hard to feel like this is the direction you would have us go. Father, I pray that you would enable us to relax. That as we breathe in your gift of life, we breathe in also the invitation to be as you are. You who pour down rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You who know how to give good gifts. You who, though we were still your enemies, and gave us your Son, that we might share in his life eternally with you. And as we give thanks, we commit ourselves to living as he did, open-handed and blessed by the poverty of spirit we carry with us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.